diagnostic app, um, you know, understanding the basics of it so that you're at least able to get uh, a purview of how you can start off on it. So that's what we've been doing so far. We've had sessions on um, what skills we need for blockchain and Abhijit has taken a lot of sessions on how Flowcard was formed and what went around it and how, uh, you know, they've been using blockchain. So Ritwik today is uh, going to go back, I think not back, but uh, essentially talking about uh, what block how it works and how is it different from our conventional way of doing things so um okay. yeah so Ritwik, over to you i think you can take on from here uh, thank you so good a uh, very good morning to all uh i'm Ritwik. i'm working in 366 by a software developer so for today's session, uh, we'll be looking over how blockchain works and how is it different from our conventional database. So let's just start at the basic on like, uh, let's just have a quick review on what is blockchain. So in the very basicest of the terms, blockchain can be defined as a system of recording information in such a way that cheating a system, changing values is almost impossible. So today we'll be talking about, when we talk about blockchain today, we'll be looking over on the blockchain, like the initial time, the inception of blockchain on how it came into play, what items and how it worked then, and how is it working now after the evolution has been done on the blockchain. So there will be a lot of items today we'll be talking about like hashing, mining, minting, all those information uh, you'll get accordingly. So let's start now. So blockchain is a new class of information technology that combines cryptography and distributed computing systems, both of which has existed for a number of decades and a genius named Satoshi Nakamoto. I guess you might have heard him, heard of him. He is the founder of Bitcoin. And he combined those together to create a model or a network of computers to collaborate together, maintaining a shared and secure database. As such, we can say that the blockchain technology is simply a distributed secure database. So currently we are looking at the inception of blockchain, which is, let's just call it for this session, version one of blockchain. And the current uh, blockchain, evolved blockchain that we're using, will be referring to that as blockchain version 2.0, let's say. So for blockchain version one, it was simply a storing mechanism where we did not allow any user to make any changes to any existing data once it's committed. It was based on um, distributed systems and cryptography. So <clears throat> now uh, we can say that, uh, so our uh, database consists of, uh, so basically a blockchain, uh, we'll be calling it right now as database. So uh, our blockchain consists of strings of blocks, each one with a record of data which is encrypted and given a unique identifier known as hash and the mining on the computers for the network validates each transaction and then adds them to the block they are building and they broadcast the completed block to other nodes so they all have a copy of the data because there is no centralized component to verify the alterations to the data uh, to the blockchain uh, so blockchain depends upon the distributed consensus algorithm in order to make all entry onto the blockchain and all the computers to have agree about this state so that no one computer can make an alteration without the consensus of other. Once it is completed, the block goes into the blockchain as a permanent record. So in essence, what we can say is a blockchain, whenever a new data is getting added, it is verified by all the peers of the network. And once it is verified, it is added in the blockchain and every node gets an updated copy of the new block, which in our blockchain world, we call it as a ledger. So every node inside the blockchain has all the blocks and all the values. So there is no centralized authority or there is no centralization. It is completely decentralized. So every particular node holds a certain value, holds all the blocks, which is why whenever someone tries to make an alteration to a particular block, it is immediately verified by all the other nodes available on the network. And if it is verified, if it is well and good, it's fine. We can add that as another record. But let's say if someone tried to add 
edit an information or update a record. It cannot be done because other nodes will immediately reject because, okay, this doesn't match with the record. This is not right. And with that, we can also trace it back to the person or at least the address which tried to make the alteration done. And the blockchain, it is all connected to each other by links in like in a proper linear chronological manner. Blockchain is designed in a way that the transactions are mutable, meaning they cannot be deleted. And each block contains a hash value that is dependent upon the hash from the previous block. So they are all linked together. Meaning if one is changed, then all the other blocks linked to it forward will be altered. This works to make the data entered tamper proof. So what did we get here? So we understood that uh, blockchain is a collection of records. It is linked with each other through links and through hash codes, and it is strongly resistant to alteration and it is protected using cryptography. So there are multiple cryptography, every blockchain has their own. So our Bitcoins uses SHA 264, then there is our Ethereum uses ETHash. It, these are all their own encryption methods that they have implemented on their own blockchains. So let's move on to see what is inside a block in a blockchain. I mean, we talked about blocks, we talked about a blockchain. So what is inside a block? So majorly there are three values inside each block. One of them is address, another one is data, and the third one is hash. So right now let's talk about the address. So because it is a linear chain, like just like our singly linked list, which holds the address to the previous one. And because, and because it is a linear chain and interconnected, it always stores the address of the previous block. It helps the identify the block. Also, when we talk about blockchain, we talk about something known as the, uh, the inception of the data. We can always trace it back. How do we trace it back? This is exactly how, because we know the address to the previous block. So let's say I stored, uh, had some values in block uh, two, then I updated uh, in block three. This block two, when I added some value in block two, this was the first commit to that information in block two. And then I updated that information in block three. So when we talk about the update, we can always trace it back to the where the data was firstly incorporated in our blockchain when it was first added. And we can always understand, okay, so this is the particular time. This is, okay, this is the, when we started. And also it is always timestamp. So we can always trace it back exactly to the very particular uh, hour and minute to when that particular transaction happened. Now, the second item inside a block is our data. Whenever, uh, so basically data can be anything. It could be your any value. And which is why I'm using the word data, not information or any other word, data. So whenever a data is added, it could be that we added some data or to store some information, store an instance of ownership change in NFTs. Yes, uh, we now use, uh, so in our current version of blockchain, the current evolved version, we can build applications on top of it. Earlier, it was just using as a storage for a ledger. That's why the word ledger was there because it was just storing information. Now we are building applications on top of it. So NFT is just one of them. What is NFT? It is our non-fungible tokens. So when we are talking about NFTs, let's say I created an NFT and I stored it in block two. And this is stored inside block two with my digital signature, which is my private key, which is which helps me to sign that particular document that, okay, this belongs to me. So no one other than me on this particular block can say this data belongs to them because it is digitally signed by me with using my private key. And my private key is like my password. It is only known by me. So let's say I added a NFT in block two and then I sold it to someone and then that iteration happened in block three. So let's say I took, I had an NFT and I sold it to Amitesar. That happened in block three. So now whenever we'll be uh, looking at that NFT and the current ownership of that NFT, it will always be with Amitesar, not with me. So this helps us prove ownership as well. So, and when we are talking about NFTs, we cannot leave the point. Very famous question, whenever you talk about NFT, it is asked that, okay, it is just a picture. Why can't we just screenshot it? I mean, we can save it. And since I took the screenshot, it should be mine. But that's when it gets tricky. 
yes, the screenshot belongs to you, but the image in the screenshot is never yours. And there is no way you can ever prove that the image was yours, the inside one, because you have no proof of ownership. You just have a proof of screenshot. But when it comes to our blockchain, let's say if we commit it, if we commit that value on the block, then that particular item becomes mine. Yes, and that is where one of the uh, threat that holds NFT comes into place, which is, let's say there is an existing NFT. I took a screenshot, I uploaded that screenshot as an NFT. That is tricky. Yes, you can do that because that screenshot belongs to you. That screenshot is yours. You updated it as an NFT and then again, you sold it. So that is one tricky part where blockchain is NFTs are getting backtracked a little, but uh, there are people who are working on it. And once there is a solution, we'll be looking forward to more and more updates on that. But for now, we can keep track of the NFT ownerships and, uh, and all the ownerships can be stored inside our box and always trace back to its origin. So let's say I sold it, I sold my NFT, but still I'm using my this particular block too, to prove my ownership. But then again, the other person who said that he also has the same NFT, he bought it from, me, they can always go back and say, see, this is the block where I was stored. And since this will always hold the value address for the previous one, they can always go back and see, okay, you know what? You had that NFT ownership for a while, then you sold it. And that information will be stored in here. And we can always trace it back because, well, it is always connected in a linear way. So. The third value, which brings us to our third value, which is our hash code. So this is like a unique identifier to each block. Every blockchain has n number of blocks. It can have n number of blocks. It, there is no limit to it. How do we identify each block? That is where the hash code comes in. It is like a unique identifier to each block. It will be unique every time, no matter how many blocks are added to a blockchain. So as you can see, this particular hash is 8y5c9 and block 3 is storing the previous hash address and this block 2 is storing block 1's address but as you can see the previous hash is 0000, 000. block 1 has no hash there is nothing behind it sorry uh, so what is this this is known as the genesis block on this every blockchain has their own genesis block on which on top of which the entire blockchain works. So right now we are building, let's say we are building some applications. Every time we build an application, we have our own Genesis block to our own, to us. So let's say my NFT, which I do, said that I stored in block two. So for my NFT, my block two would be my Genesis block. So from here, my NFT's uh, path started and it can go forward to block three being sold to someone else then he sold it to someone else. Then I, again, I bought it back. So it could, it will become a chain for that particular NFT. And that for that NFT, this block two will be my Genesis. So, and also this chain of records is known as the ledger in blockchain. So now that we know what is inside a blockchain, let's see how the data gets stored inside a blockchain. So how does a block gets added in a blockchain? So let's just have a look over this picture for a second. So we initiate a transaction. The transaction details are broadcasted to miners because there is not just one miner. There are n number of miners working 24 seven to ensure all the data gets added in the block as soon as possible. Once the miners confirm that, okay, mining is done and the miner always gets a reward for it. And then it is added to the blockchain. And then the blockchain, uh, then the transaction is completed the block is added and every node, every person who has, who is a node of this particular blockchain gets an updated ledger. So now let's look into a little more detail. So every transaction gets validated first. If the validation is successful, it gets added to the block. The validation is done by someone known as miner, which we just saw. So miners job is to verify the transaction to know that if it is a legit transaction, if it is the correct transaction, if, and they get rewarded for verifying the information. So there is also a common question among all of the uh, people who are new to blockchain. Okay, how do we do mining? We hear a lot of people who made a lot of money on that monetary values. They mine blockchain and now they're, uh, they mine something around Bitcoins and now they're just happy. Where do, where does all of those come from? 
they just simply come from this particular part when the transaction details is broadcasted to the miners miners have to verify if they verify it correctly they get some amount of appreciation token which is getting stored for them so we'll also have a detailed session on how mining is done in the future sessions but for now let's have a look okay so let's say at any given instance there are miners like n number of miners working and uh, okay so n number of miners are working every time they get uh, broadcasted details okay this particular transaction is coming incoming they'll verify so how do they verify they verify they have very complex algorithms to learn so let's say yes you can do mining on your own laptop but once you start i mean you can hear your cpu's fan go running at the top speed you can hear the moving parts inside your laptop why because the algorithms and everything which requires to verify those transactions it's a lot because every blockchain is currently very big and they have one too many details to verify before they can confirm that this transaction transaction is legit so before that happens they have to do n number of mathematical operations and every time they do it it requires some power so when they do that and that power that you are helping that blockchain with is why you are getting rewarded for every time so <clears throat> once the mining is done let's say okay i did some mining and once that transaction is verified so every node in that particular network gets an updated ledger and every node which is connected in that slide they'll get updated okay so this new block has been added so every node is now updated with the new ones but let's say if the transaction failed let's say the verification was not done i mean the verification failed something was wrong now it's it's not just uh, it's not that just we can stop the transaction okay the mining stop we can also trace it back to the owner to the actual owner okay so this address is where this transaction came in from and we can also see why it failed we will never know the data which was sent or which was getting mined because it is encrypted but we can always see that okay this failed and who uh, who was the person responsible we can always check the address so when we talk about encryption we so there is two particular key elements of a blockchain so for every user there is a public key and then there is a private key so public key keys are like our email addresses we can always give it to anyone who would, who we would like to send emails to and our private key is like our password which is only known by the user so the public key as the name suggests it is available for everyone and the private key is like our password so let's say we want some crypto so i want to send some crypto amount to let's say a person b how does this process start i start my transaction so what are the things that transaction might look at so for verification there are a few things that they look for firstly do i have enough amount that i'm sending that will be my step one i'm just using this as an example there are a lot of other uh, parts which gets verified as well at the same time i'm just using a very shortened version of that example so will they firstly check that uh, if the user has enough balance secondly if my address is correct and the latest amount that i have holding against my address is ample or not once it is verified okay perfect next step where am i where am i sending does that person have a wallet does that person have a proper address is that person available is that person is on the network then that values are verified those values are verified and once that those values are verified the person the let's say the miner was doing those verification they'll get rewarded some points in the middle and once this transaction is verified the person will b will get the value but let's say we can see that every time there is a new block added to the blockchain everyone gets a copy of the node right everyone in the node gets a copy of the new block how are we saving the information i mean how does let's say i send some money to someone else how is it stopping someone else on the network to not use the whatever amount crypto i sent it is because of the encryption so the moment i send any information it is firstly what happens is it is encrypted with my private key which is my digital signature so once it is signed by me it is available okay so these values are available and this is being sent by me now what it does is it looks for the public address of the receiver once the public address is verified 
it adds it sends it to that public address now the only way that decryption on that data can happen is by the receiver's private key once the receiver's private key is used he can always verify okay so i received this amount and that is when okay so the transaction is completed and then the person we can view the data in their wallet i hope you guys remember the wallet because we had a session earlier in how to set up wallets how we can use our public key to share information uh, so now that we know how block gets added in the blockchain let's have a look over how can we use blockchain in our daily day-to-day -day life i mean how is blockchain affecting how is blockchain being used on a daily basis i mean what is the point of adding all those information in one place so first of all it's a trusted network because it's a decentralized network and every value is getting verified so i'll use three examples here and the first two are interrelated and you can you'll understand in a minute so we know that we all go to hospitals to get checkups done right so every time we go to a hospital we get a checkup done and those reports get generated then let's say we were not satisfied by that hospital we go to another hospital now what they'll do is they'll do the, they'll they'll run those tests again because they can't trust them and there's all that's also one of the ways our medical industry is making money because to run more and more tests so what they'll do now is they'll run again the same test result could be different yes there are a number of reasons involved but there is a good chance as well that the results could remain same there might not be a lot of changes so both the hospitals doing the same information both the hospitals keeping your data in their protected form so now as a person your private information let's say your blood sample reports are stored in two different places for no good reason i mean they are not going to be using it further but they are holding your information so now let's say if i get better test done of my blood report and store it in a blockchain and every time i go to a hospital and i provide them with my details they can access from that particular from the latest block where the last update for my blood report was there wouldn't that be better because now they cannot hold my record it's already in the blockchain so now they can just constantly access it now and they don't have to do anything new and yes of course if they need to run new tests obviously they'll do it but now there my data is not being held by a private authority or any private company it is being held in a decentralized way inside a blockchain again we can just go to another example which is banks we can have multiple accounts in multiple banks again they hold a lot of our information they hold our addresses they hold our phone numbers our emails our pan ids and a lot of other information again all those can be centralized inside a blockchain and then <laughs> it is ironic uh, that we are using a centralized uh, saving system and you and the system is in itself decentralized so now the banks can also use the same method to access that those information so now i can whenever we talk about any permanent information which won't change over time we can always look for a possibility of having those values in blockchain but if the value constantly keeps getting changed we can always just go back to rsql we'll get into those uh, discussion in a minute or so but for now let's have a look uh, again come back to the point so now they both have their own individual values now let's say the both banks can just access from that block okay so these are the information from this person let we can either allow them to open an account or not or like for a number of reasons the banks whatever they use it for so what do we see here that we can stop uh, allowing all the uh, all the private institutions to hold our private data instead what we can do is we can have our private data or whatever um the data which doesn't change we can just keep it in a centralized in a central place and have give them access whenever they require that way no one is maintaining our data and our data is in a decentralized way and unless we provide them the access they'll never be able to access it so which brings us to another tricky part which is smart contracts so what is smart contracts it is a self executing contract based on the terms of contracts of the agreement or operations directly written into lines of codes which is stored and executed directly on the blockchain like normal computer programs but 
there is a key difference between running a normal computer program and running a smart contract. Smart contracts run on blockchain. What do we know about blockchain? All the data which is going in the blockchain is already verified. If it was not verified, it will never go there. So once we can be sure that the input is always going to be correct, we can write a simple logic of simple smart contract to ensure, okay, yeah, you know what, this information is coming in, this will always be correct. So we can always plan our contracts better that way. We don't have to write n number of use cases. Okay, so it might fail because of this, it might fail because of this, because we already know in the first hand that the data is correct. Why do we know? Because every item in blockchain is tamper proof. It is already on decentralized network, so no one can alter the data. And the best part about smart contracts is it executes automatically. There is no manual push required. There is no manual timing required. It executes automatically. So <clears throat> we can just use smart contracts in the previous two scenarios. Okay, so, and use smart contracts in a way to allow someone to have an access to our private data. Let's say I wrote a contract. Okay, if I send uh, something, uh, some information, it will allow someone that is also be, will be in the encrypted form in the receiver receiver's address, we can share that, we can encrypt that entire value, whatever data we want to share and the address, and we can just share, uh, send that to our, send that to the block. And the smart contract, what it will do is, it will check that if the data is correct, if it will check if the address is correct, and then just send that data to that particular uh, person. And then they can only use their private key to access that information. And now let's, look over the third example this is a really nice example because i mean you'll get that in a second so we can design token economics on blockchain which is how the bitcoins the ethereum eth network and the flow block uh, flow points and a lot of uh, token economics is already working on blockchain it is already being used in multiple ways uh, so in fact uh, we in Flowcard, we are using Flow blockchain, uh, which uses Flow coins. So you make a new ID, you get some Flow, flow coins, which is good for a lot of transactions. And then once you run out, you can always reach out to the customers. Uh, we, you can always reach out to the uh, on the page on contact us and then just ask for more coins. But let's say, how can we? Uh, what are the other ways we can use the coins? How can we use the token economics? So let's say. I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about city traffic since I live in Bangalore and it is really famous for its traffic because we are always stuck in one traffic signal for about an hour or so and that's on a daily basis. So how is it getting controlled right now? It is getting controlled by the centralized authorities. They have put in a fixed timer for every signal. Okay, this signal will go on for 70 seconds. Then again, this signal will stop for another three or minutes, three minutes or so. That way, Yes, it works when the traffic is not as much, but at the same time, let's say <clears throat> there is a there is an ambulance which is coming on that way. It gets stuck because of a red light and there is a critical patient inside that ambulance. Yes, ambulances are allowed to break the traffic signal in case of emergency. Yes, they get the way. And yes, people are also supposed to move out of the way. But if it is a really messy traffic, there is no way anyone can move even the pedestrians are stuck. So that way the ambulances will be stuck there forever. What we can do here is, let's say in the terms of autonomous cars, every car is sending out information every second about their routes they are taking. So let's say there is an ambulance which is taking a certain path and the red light might be coming soon in the next 10 seconds, the kilometer and our ambulance is about 800 meters away. We know that it will never make it in the next 10 seconds to the signal. But if we just increase the signal time to, let's say, 30 seconds, it will help the ambulance go. And we can always do that by prioritizing. So what we can do here is every car is sending out the tokens, which is getting stored. And the signals are also getting the information from the blocks directly, whatever the information is getting updated. So if there is a token which is holding certain value, let's say an ambulance, ambulance's value, so it might pr prioritize that. It can prioritize that particular signal. Okay, you know what? You can go green for a little longer today because there is an ambulance on the way. Yes, this seems like far-fetched uh, in our current world right now, but 
Yes, it is possible because at the same time, uh, how we are incre increasing in the blockchain world, the same is happening in the uh, world of IoT. The more we learn, the more we explore IoT, there are more possibilities. Yes, it seems. Yet is uh, is it seeming? It is seeming far fetched right now, but it won't be in the near future itself. Everything will be decent. It should be decentralized. It, once it is there, we can always have and go back and look that okay, you know what? This is much better. Because even if a person is standing there and doing the job, we can always automate that if it is not a manual, like if it is not a manual task. So now that we have seen how blockchain works in our daily life and how those committed data can be used on a daily basis, let's have a look over our second part of the session, which talks about our how to decide like which one to use, conventional database or blockchain. Both have their own perks, both have their own demerits. So on the most basic level, we can always say that blockchain is a type of new database. But if we look closer, blockchain is a set of protocols and cryptography methods that enable a network of computer to work together to securely record data within a shared open database. Uh, sorry, was there a question? Okay. Uh, so the primary difference between a blockchain and a database is centralization. Why I say centralization? Because we just discussed that blockchain is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, but database is a centralized mechanism. The database is centralized, our uh, conventional databases. So there is always an admin access who can alter the data at any time on their will. And there is no way that anyone else can do anything about it. But in blockchain, even if you want to change, alter a data, you cannot. Yes, there is one way you can do that. That is known as 51% attack. So basically in that scenario, what you do is you get the 51% of the nodes to work for you and in your favor. And then if you commit that, then all the blockchain subsequent blockchains will be, blocks will be adjusted accordingly. But that is highly unlikely scenario. But inside our database, the admin can always edit the data. So let's say uh, you went ahead and got a job and your designation is, let's say, software developer. And one day uh, you were doing something and you got an access to the main database, the company's database, the main, like the sole database. What you do is uh, you give yourself a promotion, you give yourself a salary hike. And once you have made that edit, there is no traceability. That information is there to stay until someone changes otherwise, until unless the concerned people who can see, okay, you know what? This guy is not in this position. They have to manually check. But let's say I joined a company. They gave me a designation of software developer and they defined the salary and they put it on blockchain. Now I cannot change that. Even they cannot change that. No one can change that. It is there to stay. So once the blockchain is a value is committed, there is no alteration. So yes, they can also say, let's say I, after a year or two years, I get promoted. So now the promotion, we can always trace back to where they put me the first, where I joined. Okay, so this is, let's say block number two. This is where I joined. I got the, uh, I got the software developer job. We can always trace it back, make a link that, yeah, okay. So now this guy is a senior software developer or software developer too. So now they updated that information and we can always trace it back. Okay, so this guy joined as a software developer. He got promoted on this day after two years or something. But in database, you can just make that edit happen and there is no going back. There is no undo. So the when we talk about blockchain, <clears throat> The uh, so the primary difference between a block uh, so while all the records secured on a database is centralized, each participant in a blockchain has a secured copy of all the records, ledgers, and all the changes. So and of all the changes, not just the new additions to the block, all the changes as well. So each user can view the provenance of the data, and the magic happens when there is an inconsistency, since each participant man maintains a copy of records. Blockchain technology will immediately identify and correct any unreliable information. 
so let's say your friend is wearing a smart watch and someone tried to change that uh, it automatically immediately self corrected for daylight saving time for some reason so even if a third person let's say tried to maliciously change the time so they would be late to some of their task what blockchain did was it automatically identified and checked and connected itself based on the coding business logic which is our smart contracts and the consensus and the participants are intrinsically able to trust it because it is decentralized everyone has a copy so we can use an example here so let's say there are two companies which are willing to collaborate together but they are never willing to share their books because that's their information so let's say they both decided okay so there is this uh, we cannot trust your database administrator uh, says the company b to company a, and the company a says to b okay we cannot trust your database administrator as well so how do we share data without knowing that either one of us will not make an change in the database so what they can do is they can just put that information on a blockchain so what that will do is both can verify okay so this is the data there available and now there cannot be any changes because the moment that change happens it will be committed to a new block yes if the data is correct but at the same time the other company will also have a new fresh set of copy immediately because the moment a new data gets added every node gets updated so that way there is a trust which is involved in blockchain so when we talk about this blockchain and database so what database provides us it's crud information create uh replicate update and delete operations but in blockchain it is only insert and view there is no edit option there is no edit option in the blockchain so database provides us with create and update and delete options yes databases are there it will never go obsolete because whenever we talk about database and blockchain they both have their own use cases so if there is a permanent record i would suggest it should definitely go on blockchain because it is stored and it won't be altered but inside a database let's say if you added your permanent record as well it can still get altered you can still edit it anyone with admin rights can edit it but then there are records which constantly needs to get changed those day information can always stay back on the database side or conventional database because those information constantly needs to be updated we cannot just constantly keep on going back to tracing okay so this is where all the changes happen no we just want the we just want to see the changes that happened we don't want to trace it where it started we just want to see so picking blockchain or database conventional database it solely dependent upon the use case of why you are picking a database option anything in that matter so let's say uh, uh if i just added some information on blockchain it will be there forever now if i want to update it i add i commit another blockchain now those two are linked now those two informations can go hand in hand now there is another update constantly update and with each commit to the blockchain as well there is a little bit of time involved in the committing slight time that it requires to verify all the information and to create a new block and to commit to a certain block it takes a little bit of time sometimes yes but in database once you hit update button if the database is not that big it will update immediately that is there but again it's the same with blockchain if the blockchain is really small if it is a new up and coming blockchain the this part of committing a data so basically minting or mining a data it doesn't take a long time it it just happens in a snap just like a normal database but then again picking one over other is not the solution it depends solely upon our use case on how we are using it and why we are planning on using the database in the first place uh so uh that's uh, the end of my session if there are any questions please go ahead No, oh, thank you, Ritwik. I think it was a great session. Um, I am looking forward for any more questions or queries from people.
Okay. So I think everyone's fall asleep with it because they're like mesmerized <laughs> by your talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there was this person, Ajit, who had a question about uh, mining, I believe. And then there was another question about usually contracts are vetted through advocates because folks feel they can be easily cheated. How does a smart contract help? So they will have a dedicated session on smart contract. But one of the things I can tell you is you know, the smart contracts are machine driven contracts and there are rules that are these machines work on. So uh, you set up these rules in a simplistic fashion for these machines to talk to each other. Now, these contracts can be uh, written by machines, can be deployed by machines as well if they have enough funds. But uh, in, in the current context, be it NFT or any other scenario that uh, Ritwik mentioned briefly about, most of these contracts are deployed with uh, committed resources. And those committed resources, um, unfortunately, right now are all financial resources. So you actually have to buy either a gas or an ether to, uh, to deploy those co contracts. So it's pretty much machine driven. Now, uh, there are scenarios where uh, uh, people felt cheated or the smart contracts was deployed, but it was actually hacked. So I've passed on the link uh, to you wherein we have a way to solve that problem, which we call it as a blockchain contract. It's of course, as an, a smart contract uh, methodology, but we have a human uh, intervention at the EP. So idea there is that we identify the risks that are associated and we de-risk uh, based on the human intervention and we give a human a final control uh, whether or not what to do in case of uh, there is a, an essence of cheating. Second, uh, our understanding and approach to blockchain is not about having a fully decentralized approach, but also to comply with the law enforcement and uh, work with the sovereignty of the countries. Because as and when, if you really want to have a mass adoption, it has to work with the, uh, the legal clauses that exist and with data protection rights and uh, uh, scenarios and laws coming into an existence. It is much more critical now to be able to align to those laws than to actually defeat the whole purpose to begin with. So we'll have a dedicated and committed session on to it sometime in the future. We'll certainly take up this question and this question could be a great starting point wherein uh, we can compare an actual advocates of our courtroom to the, uh, the machine-driven um, uh, advocates uh, in the machine world. Okay, going, going back to the session, any more questions from anyone? All right. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, so, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a great session, Ritwik. Uh, it was undoubtedly. And it was a great session, Ritwik. I think wonderful session. And I'm pretty sure this session will be one of the, in fact, it is one of the best sessions of, of the learning events that we had. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thanks.